Thanks, Erin. Uh, apologies for my coughing and spluttering. I think all the fresh air here in Australia is uh, hurting my lungs somehow. <laughs> <coughs> so, over the last half decade, a remarkable expansion has taken place in China's information security community. What was an isolated regional market has more than doubled in size, while developing a mature global player that is growing more than three times as fast as a global market. It's also developed an innovative security research community who participate in international conferences and claim top prizes in global challenges. And just this month, the first DEF CON security conference outside of Las Vegas was held in Beijing. Yet, during this growth and global integration, tensions are also rising in a number of ways. The rise of cyber balkanization through trade conflict and regulation. Zero day nationalism coming from industry. Zhou Hongyi, one of the co-founders of the security company 360, whose teams have been very active in international presentations and the competitions, last October expressed some anxiety that the US and other countries organize hacking competitions, but in his observation, no US team participated, quote, because it is collecting intelligence. Once shown, your vulnerability cannot be used again. He considers these zero days an important strategic resource that should remain in China. And following this, we have also had reports that Chinese security researchers have been banned from attending conferences, perhaps indicating the emergence of zero day regulation in China. My goal in this talk is to help you understand Chinese hackers in their own context. I'll share with you some of what I've learned while working and playing in the Chinese security community over the last five years. I talk mainly about how Chinese hackers identify in Chinese culture and how hacker culture has integrated into a more collective society. Now, I have a, more than a few old friends and former colleagues who, for understandable reasons, find it difficult not to think about Chinese hackers only as the opposition or even the enemy. If any of you feel this way, I hope you'll also benefit from understanding better the pressures and opportunities faced by Chinese hackers, even from the point of view of know your enemy. And I promise that is going to be the closest I'll come to quoting from Sun Tzu's Art of War. But we will take some excursions into Chinese history and some popular culture, because to understand Chinese hackers, of course, we need to try and understand a little bit more about their environment in China. A little bit about me. I worked in IT security since the mid-90s in finance and telecommunications, in Australia with banks and Telstra and NBN Co. I was working uh, penetration testing and security research for 10 years, and then worked for Huawei in Shenzhen from 2014 for three years. I'm the local organiser for the DEF CON group in Shenzhen, and now I work as a product security specialist, focusing on radio and testing connected devices. So, why China? In 2011, I was working for a pen testing company building what you'd now call a threat intelligence capability. This was a time when the Chinese threat actors were still getting a lot of attention. 2009 and 10 had been busy years with the Google Aurora attacks, followed by local attacks against mining companies. I'd been learning Chinese just as a hobby for a few years, so I decided to research Chinese threat actors. In that study, despite its focus on externally directed attacks, I noticed that the bulk of hacking activity in China was directed at local Chinese targets. I was curious, looked around the Chinese security industry, and noticed there was hardly any local penetration testing capability or business. So this seemed to be an opportunity, and so I set my sights on working in China as an interesting place. In Vegas at DEF CON 21, I was fortunate to meet the members and sponsors of the Blue Lotus team from Tsinghua University. When I next visited China later that year, as well as catching up with some of the individuals in the Beijing scene, I was introduced to many of the relatively new firms working in information security. But at the time, if you wanted to work purely as a white hat, there wasn't much work, unless PCI, PCI compliance was your thing. Um, it was a main consulting opportunity, partly because it was one of the few enforced security regulations in China. Um, but of course, there was always an opportunity uh, to work in jailbreak exploits and get paid quite a bit of money to feed the growing third-party app store and malware market. But 
there was no real legality about the, no real certainty about the legality of pen testing. And there was also a quite a new online disclosure community known as Wu Yun, which we'll talk a bit more about later. But at this time, change was already happening. Of course, 2013 June, SCMP published Snowden revelations that the NSA had hacked into Chinese mobile phone companies to collect text messages, and also hacked into Tsinghua University, and as recently as that January, compromising more than 60 systems in an attempt to penetrate the university research network in China. Further revelations came March 2014, the very week I started working at Huawei in Shenzhen, telling how the NSA had penetrated Huawei systems in Shenzhen to obtain information about the workings of Huawei's products and to seek evidence of spying links to the PLA and to facilitate the exploit of Huawei's products. So these and other Snowden revelations, together with the Chinese cybersecurity regulations that developed out of that, kicked the local, security, local cybersecurity industry into high gear. Still, none of, this, none of this really established the legitimacy of white hackers. It took about 18 months before attitudes had broad enough even to allow me to start the DEFCON group in Shenzhen. Partly, this is because the name hacker in Chinese still has a strong connotation to illegality, which is hard to shake. So we'll look a little bit into the word for hacker and try and trace some of its connections which feed into Chinese ideas about hacking. Hei is how you say hacker in Chinese and it entered as a loan word in the mid-1990s. A loan word uses the sounds of Chinese characters, usually a Mandarin, to approximate the pronunciation of the source word, in this case hacker. Uh, hacker Hei Ke is often said to mean dark guest or black visitor. Now, one of the delights of Chinese is how loan words that borrow characters for their sounds can also pick up some meaning. Coca-Cola in Chinese, for example, is uh, which means smooth in the mouth and happy <laughs> and amusing. So this is a great branding and they did really well. So in Chinese, you can't always say the meaning of a word is made up just by combining these characters together. But it's true that each of these characters bring their own bit of meaning and colour the, the, the meaning of the word as a whole. So, looking at the first character, he, does in fact mean black or dark. From its earliest forms though, it had connotations of illegality. Originally, it was a pictograph illustrating someone whose face had been tattooed as a punishment for crime. Now, it's rare in Chinese to find it used in a positive sense apart from simply describing the colour black. In the days before uh, Didi, which is the rideshare service which ate Uber in China, if you wanted to use a private car, you would call a hei chu, a black car. If you're a member of a criminal gang, a hei bang, working in the underworld, hei dao, you might be employing illegal workers, hei gong, or supplying the local black market, hei shu, with goods smuggled on a black ship, hei chan. So, Black really means illegal. And he has always struggled under this sense of illegality, having an even stronger connection with illegal activity than it does in English. Now, there have been other variations. Uh, Hongke, substituting Hong, red for he, was a name taken by nationalistic hackers, which really came to the fore after the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, and then again after the collision of the spy plane in 2001. Uh, Haike is more commonly used in Taiwan. Hai means something like surprised or shocking. Now, there have been attempts in mainland, and you'll hear mainland Chinese say that Haike is really the illegal version, trying to leave Haike more, more neutral, just like people have done this in English with Cracker as the illegal version and Hacker as a kind of somehow more neutral version. But that hasn't been successful pretty much in Chinese as it has, hasn't in English. So, what happens in Chinese is you end up saying he mao zhe, uh, black hat, or bai mao zhe he ke. But in fact, it's a second character that brings more meaning into uh, he ke. So it's true that this, the, the kind of common meaning is a guest, visitor, or passenger, or a customer. And you can kind of see in that original character, in the oldest form, it kind of has a, a hut, a, it's a mouth, and a hand, or even a figure who's representing your guest in your house. Uh, it's not as recognisable in the modern version, but the character hasn't actually changed that much. But it also has the meaning of someone who has a certain occupational pursuit. So examples of this are chuang ke, is a maker in the maker community, 
or a zikke is an assassin. And this is in fact the meaning that seems to have introduced the deepest association for hike in Chinese culture. The Xia Ke are heroes of popular martial arts genre known as wuxia. So here's an example from a Chinese hacker magazine from the early 2000s. Hacker masters must also be wuxia lovers, traveling invincibly in two worlds with the same unreality and beauty. Sitting in front of a computer alone, watching thousands of lines of data flowing on the screen like waterfalls, like shooting stars. Every break-in is like performing the most beautiful music sung in the, river, sung in the rivers and lakes. I'll explain rivers and lakes a little bit because it's a special term in Chinese, Jianghu. It means, originally it evoked uh, remote regions beyond government control. In the wuxia genre, as it's mentioned in the quote, it's kind of evolved to mean the martial arts scene. And in fact, Jianghu is a word that often means scene, the music scene, they use the same word. But normally it defines uh, a culture or a counterculture, the knowledge, the codes and the relationships that make up that culture. And so in the wuxia novels, it's also part of formal challenges where the skills of individuals are tested to establish the supremacy of their martial arts school. It's also worth noting that one of the strongest connections that's come out between hackers and wuxia was made, or maybe kind of is demonstrated in the matrix being titled Hikke Diguo, the Hacker Empire, in its Chinese release. Many non-technical Chinese people say this is the first time they heard the word Hikke. This movie was also instrumental in Yu Yang's career change. Uh, after watching The Matrix while studying gynecology at Anhui Medical University, he pivoted to hacking and became one of China's best known white hats, Tomb Keeper. You'll regularly hear him talking and relating hacker identity to wuxia heroes. But we're going to take a little closer look at the Sha Ke. So, they're, they're pretty old. China's first historian, Sima Qian, writing more than 2,000 years ago, devoted a whole chapter of his records of the grand historian to describing them, stalling their character and giving a number of accounts of their lives. These Sha Ke are said to have possessed altruism, justice, individualism, loyalty, courage, truthfulness, disregard for wealth and desire for glory. Most of these are in fact traditional Chinese values with the exception of individualism. So it's the individualism of the Sha Ke that particularly distinguishes them as non-conformists. They valued individual capability and loyalty over more traditional authority going with family connections or political status. So the Sha Ke really represent a, a rare stream of individualism that has existed in Chinese culture from the very early days. Of course, this doesn't go down well with the political class. Sima Qian started this uh, chapter with a quote from a philosopher known as Han Fei, who criticized the Sha Ke among five other vermin, including scholars, speech makers, people avoiding military service, and artisans. I'll quote a little from the passage because the legalists are important in Chinese philosophy. These are the customs of the disordered state. Its scholars praise the ways of former kings and imitate their humaneness and rightness, put on a fair appearance and speak in elegant phrases, thus casting doubt upon the laws of the time and causing the ruler to be of two minds. Its swordsmen gather bands of followers about them and perform deeds of honor, making a fine name for themselves and violating the prohibitions of the five government bureaus. Han Fei, he's often described as China's Machiavelli, was one of the original legalists. They were a strong influence on the first emperor, Qing Shi Huang. Their emphasis on the absolute power of the ruler the insignificance of the individual and the necessity of standardization and the supremacy of the law is what is credited with strengthening the Qing kingdom so it could surpass the other kingdoms of the warring states period and establish the first Chinese emperor, empire. Now, who here has seen the movie Hero by Zhang Yimou? Okay, great. I think this captures the spirit of the legalists really well. In the movie, we see the many varieties of scripts that are available for writing the character sword. They're meant to be simplified, standardized into a single character. And then the would-be assassin, even though he stays his hand and doesn't kill the king, he has to submit to the mandatory punishment that the law demands for the good of the kingdom and for the unity of the empire, and ultimately dies as a hero. Now, 
Legalism was never quite as powerful in imperial China as under the First Dynasty, but it did establish patterns of government that continued in later dynasties, although it was diluted by other philosophies. In the 20th century, however, it experienced a major resurgent with nationalist and communist thought. Notably, Mao, a lot of his poetry incorporated legalist quotes and was very heavily drawing on those early legalists. And more recently, Xi Jinping um, has been regularly quoting Han Fei as a basis for his anti-corruption campaign. The Sha Ke continued to influence some of the great literature of Imperial China, The Water Margin, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, all pick up Sha Ke characters and, and characteristics. Now, the Wuxia genre developed at the end of the Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty in China, and it incorporated Kung Fu and martial arts that flourished in that period. It grew further in popularity after the fall of the Qing and once the Republic was established, because many in China were despairing of traditional Chinese philosophy, and they were attracted to the individualism and freedom of the Sha Ke. Uh, in fact, the movie Hero is a modern, a modern example of this wuxia genre. Many of the scenes are marked by this remarkable, even supernatural, apparently supernatural abilities. They fly through the air, impossible feats of swordplay. Uh, they're battling in the treetops, and they're even walking, fighting across the surface of the water. Uh, this is a scene from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is another wuxia movie very popular in the West. Uh, so whilst these all seem like supernatural abilities, in fact, they're not. These heroes are ordinary human beings who have gained these skills, not as a gift, but by careful attention to arduous training in front of the master. So this introduces us to another aspect of Chinese culture, which I think has had a very significant impact on the hacker experience in China, which is the significance and the style of education. Now, you'll have to excuse me here because I know this is a Japanese movie, Japanese culture, but the principles are the same. A lot of what's covered here is relevant in Korean and Japanese culture. It's a generally Eastern approach to education. Diligence is a path up the mountain of books. Hard work is the boat for the endless sea of knowledge. So the main ingredient that a student brings to education is attention and hard work. So this is quite different from the common concept in the West where a teacher's role is to identify and develop the innate talents which are in a, a student. The positive side of this, and it, it has a powerful influence in Chinese education, is that anything can be taught. So that all, all that's required to master a subject is respect for the teacher and hard work. Now, this has also, however, produced a style of education that favours disciplined execution of defined tasks ahead of reflection and analysis. You see this in the National College entrance examination. It's called the Gaokao. Uh, this is happening next week in China, same time every year. It's well recognised that this has become more of a test of memorisation than it is of comprehension. The Gaokao is a life-changing opportunity to enter a premium university, which can make a, large, a huge difference for someone from regional China. And a desire for fairness has emphasised measurability. Um, but the pressure combined with this and the cruciality of the Gaokao means that the teachers end up teaching the exam, not the subjects. This leads also on to a work culture that's very effective at executing detailed instructions. And it, it extends and influences Chinese management style, producing what's been called an engineering style of management, where the leader develops the vision, which is then converted into detailed instructions. These instructions are passed down progressively lower levels, who will be reluctant to question the instructions because they're not really given the big picture. They're not expected to understand the contents of the task. The picture, the big picture belongs to the leader. And if anyone asks why, Wei Shema, the answer is absolutely an automatic Meo Wei Shema. There is no why. So for, from school through work, this frustrates many individual creative thinkers. Uh, this in fact drove a good friend of mine in China to leave without completing high school. He took a job as an auto mechanic, working there for several years before he happened to meet an old teacher who was having their car repaired. This teacher looked at him and observed and had a conversation with him that the same skills he was using to diagnose and repair mechanical problems in cars 
could be developed at university to understand and improve almost anything he set his mind to. And so he returned to study. Now he's a leader of one of Chihu 360's advanced research teams. But of course, experiences vary. Uh, about 10 years ago, 500,000 people sat the Gaokao in Anhui province. Only 50 would make it into Tsinghua University, which is the MIT or the Cambridge of, of, um, of China. One of these students, I'll call him Wen Ge, he was destined to become one of China's brightest white hats. Now he focused on nothing other than getting the highest score. He didn't even own a computer at home. Uh, he didn't actually encounter a computer until he got to university. His family could have afforded one, but they thought it was going to be too much of a distraction from preparing for the Gaokao. Well, he did get into Tsinghua University and just a couple of years demonstrated his aptitude for hacking. He was selected to be a member of the CTF team for um, Tsinghua University who competed at the final at DEF CON 21 in 2013. After finishing university, Wen Ge started a security research company. When I met him again in 2015, he had five employees. 18 months later, 50. When I visited him just last month, they were at 150. Now, most of their growth hasn't been from hiring other people who are as gifted as Wen Ge. They're hard to find, they're very expensive. It's come from leveraging a small core of creative hackers using a much larger team of intelligent, but especially diligent engineers. And in their work, vulnerability hunting and software development, they all scale really well with this model. You see this also in Chihu 360, one of China's biggest security firms. Uh, in my estimation, their research teams have about five really gifted engineers, world class. But they're supported by more than 100 good, but not elite engineers who help them implement, uh, discover vulnerabilities and put the whole package together. I think there's a principle at work here which I like to think uh, is analogous to something in photography. A photographer who has really strong artistic skills but poor technical skills can take some brilliant photographs but will struggle to find commercial success. A photographer with really strong technical skills but no real eye for composition or not much imagination is going to produce some really well executed photographs but you end up with boring images without much appeal. Now, of course, these techniques can be learned and the art can be described technically and you can imitate the art, but the output is not going to match the quality of what you get from an instinctive practitioner. So for hackers, this instinctive element, I think, is an awareness of or a curiosity about how technology is constructed. Not just technology, considering our interests in lockpicking, social engineering, even biohacking. It's a capability to see deep beyond the interface a fascination with understanding the constituent elements and how they've been assembled, and then also a delight in manipulating them, taking them apart, putting them back together to produce an astonishing result. This is inevitably subversive because that same instinct views conventions of behaviour and legal structure in exactly the same way. So I think this instinct is just as common amongst Chinese people as it is in the West. But because it's incompatible with typical mainland approaches to education and management, the capability is not nurtured or it's self-censored. But what Chinese organisations lack in nurturing creative skill, they make up for by building teams which are effective in executing these technical tasks. There's a good example of this in a story from uh, Steve Jobs' biography. So on the 17th of February 2011, Obama met over dinner with 12 Silicon Valley leaders, including John Chambers, Larry Ellison, Eric Schmidt, Mark Zuckerberg, and also Steve Jobs, one month after he took indefinite medical leave from Apple and only eight months before he died. In the biography of Jobs, Walter Isaacson reports that Jobs told Obama that Apple employed 700,000 factory workers in China, plus 30,000 engineers to support these workers. It perplexed Jobs. Why couldn't these engineers be American? There wasn't a giant technical ba education barrier. They didn't need to be PhDs. They could be educated in trade schools. If those engineers were stateside, Jobs argued, then the factories could be too. If you could educate those engineers, he said, we could move the manufacturing plants back here. So this really does demonstrate one success of the Chinese education system. Large numbers of well-trained engineers. And it works very nicely with many white hat activities like vulnerability hunting. It's a very powerful combination 
with the instinctive talent of a creative researcher. And so I think this is a really significant factor in the success of Chinese hacking teams. Of course, it's not all smooth sailing. Who's heard of Wu Yun? Okay. So Wu Yun literally means black cloud. It was founded, uh, it was a vulnerability disclosure and general community site founded in 2010. It was really one of the early centers of the hacking scene in China. The founder, Fang, Fang Xiaodun, and nine other leaders, though, were taken in for questioning. Uh, this has been reported as being arrested uh, in the Western media, but it's something more like asked in for questioning and then assisting with the investigation. Now, in China, if, if you are suspected of criminal activity, you can be detained for up to seven months whilst the police investigate your case. Uh, and after seven, there's a review periods all through that, and at the end of the seven months, if you're still in detention, then they're going to press charges, which is why the Chinese judicial system has this incredibly high rate of success, because they've only decided to press charges when the case is already um, closed effectively. So uh, this all started when someone reported a vulnerability in jiayuan.com, a Chinese, a beautiful Chinese matchmaking site. Uh, after it was reported, the site noticed many people using the vulnerability to access the site without authorization. So they called in the local police, the PSB, who typically, they take their usual really broad action. As it turns out, the original, the original vulnerability reporter was detained just for four months uh, and is now apparently released without criminal charge. But Wu Yun is now offline for almost two years. It still promises an improved service there and tells you not to believe rumours and to keep faith in Wu Yun, but it seems to be pretty dead. And actually the service Wu Yun provided, which was like a, a grey area, was uh, essentially been replaced by a number of more formal bug bounty programs like uh, 360's Butian. But this demonstrates a typical path of development in China, along the lines that it's better to ask for forgiveness and permission. And this kind of applies to, even to government actions. There are many layers of government in China with lots of overlapping responsibilities. And you see a lot of experimentation. A particular branch will try it on, see how it runs for a while, until it comes to the attention of higher up in the leadership when they either own it or they disband it. China really is an environment of creative chaos. And that's something to bear in mind when you're looking at it and thinking this is all centrally planned. In fact, very little of it is centrally planned of the overall activity. Um, and this, even the regulation happens in an informal and implied way. So uh, I don't know how many of you heard about the bans on security researchers presenting overseas. So we'll just have a look at what happened there, actually. At Mobile Pwn to Own last October, Tencent's team, keen security team used a stack overflow in Huawei Mate 9 Beilong processor, which is the baseband kind of um, communications processor. Now, there'd clearly been some anxiety about disclosure through competitions, because the uh, Chi Hu's, Zhou Hongyi's comments were from the month before. But in this case, the phones which were targeted were really widely used amongst Chinese leadership. Uh, they all love Huawei phones, they're the best phones in China, not just because they used to work for them. They're high-end phones, and they're trusted. But the question was asked if there was any sort of guarantee that the zero days would be reported to the vendors in a timely fashion. The answer was that everything here was under the control of the people that run the competition. In this case, it was ZDI, Zero Day Initiative. It's owned by a Japanese company, Trend Micro. You can just imagine the reaction in Beijing. As it turns out, the, uh, the vulnerability was disclosed to Huawei in a timely manner, and it was patched very early in the process, but doubts remained over the control over this process. So Tencent received a formal slap on the wrist, but pretty much every other security research team in China has self-regulated and now are not attending overseas conferences. But there has been no instruction not to attend conferences or not to disclose vulnerabilities to vendors. Whether there's going to be further self-censorship, of course, is going to be another question. On to something more pleasant. Uh, the first DEF CON conference outside of Las Vegas last month was held in Beijing. Did anyone see this happening? Very good. It's called a beta. Uh, now, I don't know if you can tell from that, but this, this pattern actually matches, matches the shirt I'm wearing. 
This shirt is from DEF CON uh, 22 in 2014, which was the year that the White House announced they weren't going to issue any visas to security researchers traveling to DEF CON uh, because of the recent hacking. And in fact, most of my colleagues changed their business cards from security researcher to software engineer. Uh, nonetheless, it sent a very strong message that you know, you're not welcome even if you're part of the white hat community. So this shirt, produced in response, proudly announced DEF CON, stateless by design. So this really was uh, part of the philosophy of DEF CON coming to Beijing as well, even as you know, cyber balkanism is emerging and things are tightening. It's not a transplant, but it was a really creative blend of, uh, of DEF CON style with a recognizably Chinese conference style. It was a good success. There were more than 1,300 attendees, and there's a commitment for a non-beta version next year, and another, another conference at least after that, and more to come, almost certainly. So, dragons rise as clouds gather. Yun Qi Long Xiang. This is a Chinese idiom which describes how heroes rise when the circumstances demand. Hopefully, I've helped you appreciate some of the cultural context of the hacking community and explain some of the dynamics of the growing success of the white hat teams and some of the pressures they face. I also hope I've illustrated how they connect with a line of individualistic resistance which has been part of Chinese culture for as long as Chinese culture has been under authoritarian rule. And I think perhaps it has another meaning. With all these growing risks of cyber balkanization and zero-day nationalism, and all the other coming cyber gloom, I think this could be our opportunity to resist attempts to divide our hacker spirit along national boundaries. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So we have 10 minutes for questions. Here we go, it's front. Um, oh, hi, Bill Carey here, quick one. I noticed that um, at the last uh, Party Congress in Beijing, uh, Xi Jinping announced what appeared to be the formation of five new cybersecurity research and education centers. I'm unsure, well, it was a bit unsure when you read the English translation, it was there five or six national cyber research centers, education centers. This seems to indicate at the party level a bit of a, a move upwards. Is that a correct opinion? Oh, look, I mean, I think you, you can see from the cybersecurity regulations that they're taking it seriously. Um, they certainly are investing a lot in, uh, in education, and this is something that, that China has done well. You know, the reason they have such a great network of fast rail is because they built lots of fast rail universities. Uh, and it's, it's something, you know, it's this positivism they have about education and the ability to train anything that leads them to make this part of their planning. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how successful that is. Uh, because I think there is this, this, there's a dynamic, there's just that question to be answered. To what extent are they able to, to develop the hacker spirit when they don't really want people to develop individual capabilities? But my experience at Huawei was, in the lab where I worked, um, the kind of, the 10 really elite pen testers um, really got a lot of freedom compared to other people that worked at Huawei. So I think there's a pragmatism in, in Chinese management that, look, it's recognised to be an issue, and maybe they don't really know how best to, to develop the capability, but they are doing as much as they can to allow for it. Any more questions? Yeah, Peter, over the last decade or so, we've seen some organisations move to offshore things like uh, penetration testing to India because there's a large number of people there with, a, with the core skills required. Do you see uh, Chinese hackers as potentially being um, available for that kind of work uh, and, and doing testing in, in, for Australian and US infrastructure? Uh. They're far too expensive to make any money out of that. <laughs> that is, the local demands, I mean, it's, it's red hot there at the moment. Uh, and so these guys can, can ask almost anything. So if you, were, if you were trying to sell that service, on top of the language problem, the translation, 
and here's a funny thing, when you do the Gaokao, education is divided into two streams, arts and science. All the technical guys do science, and they're never really pressed to develop their, their English skills. So one of the frustrations in my job is, uh, if I want to communicate in English, uh, the really technical guys, they just don't understand me. <laughs> so I think you know, the translation issue plus the trust issue uh, is interesting. I have a number of Chinese friends in, in some of these companies who want to sell their products overseas. Um, I think it'd be hard to sell a web application firewall from China, outside of China. But I do think maybe a web application attack tool might have some potential because people will see actually, you know, maybe there's some different thinking there or a different idea. Any more questions? Cool, if you can give Peter a big thanks. Great, thank you.